Well, Happy New Year and happy same shite being served up at AB24 as Aberdeen's long search for a win after the World Cup break continues into our 120th year of existence and Callum, the 40th anniversary of Gothenburg as well. God, those memories seem very distant for the likes of us to ever see some similar success. Absolutely. I mean, I, I'm, I'm wearing a top that sort of references that. Um, references that goal if you're not watching on YouTube then uh, basically it's, it's top depicting John Hewitt's goal and Caitlin earlier was ex- asking what it was I tried to explain it and I was like oh 40 years ago this year uh, that happened we were the best mm-hmm. team in Europe 40 years since you've been any good then you've been shit for 40 years thanks Caitlin thanks very much for the reminder thank you yeah exactly well we're not getting any better um after returning from the world cup and jim goodman did try to change things um for the weekend's nil nil draw against ross county anthony stewart returning from his suspension Leighton clarkson also returning to the starting 11 and probably the biggest surprise callum was christian ramirez coming in from the cold and getting a rare start albeit in a rather unusual position of number 10 Oh, it was very odd. But I was, I was I was shocked. I was very excited, the fact he was playing. And um, to be honest, in recent weeks, I've been surprised he's been playing sort of half an hour off the bench or whatever. But I got really excited about the fact we were playing three strikers without really thinking about who's going to create anything for them and is it actually going to work? And uh, I think the answer to the latter was no. And uh, who's going to create anything for them? Nobody. So it went well. It, it did. And... Again, Jack McKenzie being the unlucky man in defence as he seems to be this season continuously being dropped. Um, and then I suppose kind of unsurprisingly, Ryan Duncan, um, well, maybe slightly harshly because I don't think he did too much wrong against Kilmarnock. Um, but Connor Barron, after the way we spoke about him after the Kilmarnock game, I think unsurprising to see him um, take some time out of the starting lineup. No, I wasn't really shocked by, by the other two. Ryan Duncan... Uh, I was upset with how he played, but at the same time, he's playing in centre mid. Uh, that's not mm. his position. Uh, and, and we're rubbish regardless. So throwing him in there probably wasn't ideal against Kilmarnock. And, uh, but I was quite, quite not maybe not happy, but relieved to see Conor Barron dropped. I think perhaps, I mean, maybe it'll do him some good. I don't know. Perhaps he was one of those individuals that Jim Goodwin had to have a, have a talk with. I think that sort of suggests that was probably the case. Mm. And, you know, we would have had this episode out to you on Wednesday, had I not been so severely hungover that I couldn't drag myself in front of the laptop and might to barely record um, an episode. But Aberdeen kind of had that lethargicness about them in in the final third. Were you disappointed with the way we approached the game? Surprised, given, as you said, you know, we went with the, the three up top because Jim Goodwin comes out and says, well, we did so much right defensively. We stopped the rot. Uh, again, that's maybe we'll come on to some of his comments uh, a little bit later. But we looked much more comfortable defensively. Mm-hmm. But up front, our problems continue. We continue that still no goal scored in the box since returning um, from the World Cup and three without a win at home after looking so dominant before um, Qatar. It's concerning. I think lethargic is definitely probably the right word to use, um, which I definitely probably, but regardless, <laughs> we'll move on. Plenty of players capable of doing something in the attacking third. However, you look at Miofsky and Ramirez, like it is for them, they require service. You've got Duke who can mm. make things sort of on his own. That's asking a lot of him. And Mike Kennedy, who I thought played pretty well, but in terms of committing players forward and being direct, and, and just being brave and, you know, thinking, getting more bodies in the box, maybe pounce on a second opportunity or whatever if they're not picking the correct crosses. It's really concerning. You think about the way we were playing going into that World Cup break, certainly at Pataudry, plenty mm. bodies getting forward, midfield runs supporting, and full-backs or wing-backs as well, two getting up and involved. It just none of that seems to be happening. Or if it is, it's not with any real urgency at all. I mean, I remember one particular occasion in the first half, Ross McCrory, or some people were saying he played quite well at right back, thought he was okay. But I remember on one occasion, he's got pl- so much grass in front of him, H- H- Kennedy up ahead of him as well, and he's just dilly-dallying, not just standing with the ball. There was no mm-hmm. sense of urgency to try and make things happen. Just happy to let Ross County get set up uh, defensively, which we were always going to come and try to do and get in and frustrate us. But it doesn't help when you're just giving them free passes. 
Um, yeah, and that's exactly what we picked up on in the preview. We knew fine well they would come in to, to sit in and frustrate and they would have absolutely bit your hand off for a point pre-match. And that is what they ended up taking. And, you know, you look at, I suppose, the way Celtic come in and, and play away from home. They move the path, the, the ball, spread the, the opposition from side to side. We don't do that often enough. Um, we're often too direct down one side and then it goes all the way back to the centre back and we then try down the other side. Um, we're maybe lacking that kind of little bit of creativity that was maybe stifled by going with the, the three strikers um, up front. But if you look at the data, as I'm sure Dave's already studied, you know, 57% possession, 24 shots, seven of them on target. It It's that being... Pro prolific in front of goal yeah. that we're suddenly lacking and I think the biggest omission is the service because I've definitely been critical of Bojan Miofsky, um in, in recent weeks but Saturday was just, just glaring how little we were offering to any of the front three I, I thought Ramirez was at least trying to you know look for the ball and try and do the link up but but Duke was quite quiet. I, I mean, you've done the notes for the episode this week, so you can tell how um, hungover I really was. But the only opportunity that we had in the first half was that Matty Kennedy opportunity, which was <clears throat> cleared off the line. But I think when you see the replay back, it almost like he shoots at the defender. Well, that's certainly how I feel. I think mm. he's really got to score. It's a, it's a pretty criminal miss. And the only other glaring opportunity that I remember is Vicente Bizawin's opportunity probably around the 80th minute I think it was where I think the ball just kind of ricochets off him he doesn't really get a chance to get a decent shot and connection and unfortunately the ball just goes straight at Ross Laidlaw and, and other than that the only clear opportunity was when Ross McCrory burst into the box in the 90th minute and you've got Vinny Bizawin on the penalty box and Johnny Hayes at the back post and Ross McCrory, in his infinite wisdom, decides to just blaze it into the red shed. There was just there was a severe lack of composure throughout the team, and I just wonder how much the recent result, uh, run of results is kind of starting to play on the, the players' minds. Possibly, I'm sort of remembering more as we think about it. Apologies <laughs> for you know not not having them in the notes to start with, but it probably tells everyone uh, if you've not seen it how memorable the game was. So don't bother watching yeah. the highlights slash lowlights. It was awful. <laughs> uh, I remember. Uh, Ryan Duncan when he came on as well he had a decent chance and he sort of well either to pick out a man or at least to try and hit, test the goalkeeper if nothing else and he ballooned it uh, high and wide as well I remember that uh, after he came on very late on into the game but it, it was awful and it's the lack of clear cut opportunities because again Matty Kennedy our biggest goal scoring threat and this is if at, least, at least this one was inside the box I suppose is that progress I don't know well some sort of progress um, I picked up the defensive side of things that I certainly thought we looked better, but you've got in the notes you want to pick up on um, Liam Scales. What's your critique, let's call it? I just think he's escaped quite a lot of criticism. I think I'm guilty for that as well. A lot of people seem to be focusing on Anthony Stewart, and once again, I'm included. <laughs> but I noticed, especially, I mean, it's against Ross County, they're bottom of the league, but all it required was a big physical striker in Jordan White to cause him an unholy amount of problems just in the physical battle. And I think a lot of a lot's been made of requiring another centre back to perhaps play, whether it's alongside Anthony Stewart to his right to get McCrory into midfield if we're playing a back three or to replace Anthony Stewart. But at the same time, on that left hand side, Liam Scales doesn't look up for the physical battle, which mm -hmm. you know that's not everything, of course. And technically maybe he's better at taking the ball out from the back or whatever. But in this league, it's a hell of a lot of, of the battle, that 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 physicality. And I just thought he struggled with Jordan uh, White in particular. But, you know, maybe I'm nitpicking, but there was just one certain occasion where he just got turned, held off and turned so easily. That sticks out in my mind uh, in the, would be the second half, so quite mm. close to in front of the Section S of the South Stand. And yeah, it, it's still concerning. And it's concerning we've not made any moves, but we will come on to that. I, I think we'll do... I see the point you're you're making, but I suppose the good thing, in a sense, is that Keller Ross doesn't really have a serious save to make in that game. Um, you know, and he's certainly been very much tested in 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 weeks gone by. So, 
Yes, maybe a little bit of vulnerability, but certainly not as much as weeks gone by. Oh, yeah, I would agree. And I think it was seven shots, one on target for Ross County. Uh, so I think that's probably, could be more telling of their quality, perhaps, uh, <clears throat> than ours. But I think defensively, it certainly was a, an improvement um, from what we've seen recently. Anyway, um, but uh, I, I, we mentioned Jack McKenzie earlier. I, th- I still think harsh for him to be left out too. Yeah. Um, and I think more and more people from what I've seen on social media, well, it's just an echo chamber of what, mm-hmm. calling for him to perhaps be in instead of Hayden Coulson. Um, I saw a lot of people well, criticising <clears throat> his uh, tricks and flicks and nutmegs instead of actually doing his job. But, you know, that's not for me to say. You know. Yeah, but, um, well... It's quite difficult when you're playing a left back that's not 100% fit as well. Um, that's all I'll say on that one. Yeah. Um, so well, neither difficult. of them are probably 100% fit, to be fair. No, but um, maybe again, says more in the manager if you're throwing in a player that isn't fully fit to, especially when you go back to that point about um, a player being up for that physicality. Um, but I kind of know what you mean about, uh, about Hayden. I think sometimes he does try and do too much when the simpler option is the better option, but... Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, when things aren't going right, these things become more highlighted. Yeah, and um, sorry, in fairness, that could be said for the other ten players in the park trying to do too much instead of just keeping it simple and yeah. effective. Yeah. Um. What did you make of the front three? Then a, a lot has been made on the performance of all three. Um. We'll come on to the subs in a minute, but did it work for you playing Ramirez, Miovsky, and Duke? Not in the fashion that we did. At times, I didn't really know what was going on, to be honest. I'm not sure if they did. Uh, uh, Do you think the- Jim Goodwin did? <laughs> Probably not. It sort of did scream. Th- that that team sort of did scream, I've got Last to chance. what I'm doing at this point mm. and just trying everything. Uh, and I think before he's starting Christian Ramirez, that has to be the case, given uh, how little we've seen of him. But it mm. wasn't convincing. I know it's difficult because, you know, Duke Miofsky sort of, well, they've gone off the boil a little bit in terms of a partnership, perhaps you could say. Mm. However, they were just getting used to that. And then to throw Ramirez in there as well, who's clearly quite rusty, having not seen much football. It didn't work for me, certainly in the fashion that they attempted it. I don't know you know, what else they could perhaps do. I don't know if Miofsky's mm. maybe better as that 10, but Ramirez's link play did look better, if not at times <clears> like, if it wasn't coming off because he was rusty. And then it forces Duke out wide a little bit more as well and um, which I think he can thrive in but at the same time when he's been our number one threat through the middle mm. it's a bit of a concern yeah and I, I suppose when you know when I spoke to Joe from the Benfica after 90 for the getting to know Duke episode that we did um, you know he said he's a good kind of attacking midfield player so Duke could have I suppose played in that number 10 but then Ramirez isn't going to be suited wide left so again you probably can't it's square pegs into uh, round holes um, in, in that scenario. But, you know, discussion at work today was, is is us starting Duke actually causing us some problems? Because, again, this is not a criticism of Duke in some, some of his performances, but we saw the success that we kind of had uh, in the early part of the season where Mioski was kind of winning a lot of the balls, ragdolling the defence, and then Duke was just coming on and running riot. Is that just, again, people looking at nitpicking scenarios? Because you could argue that in recent weeks, when Duke's been getting all the limelight, rightly so, we, sh- we should say, Miofsky's kind of gone backwards a little bit. Does he need to kind of be forced back into the into the spotlight, the, the Macedonian? I think it would benefit Miofsky, certainly. I think it would be very harsh on Duke, however. Yeah. Um, and... A player of his age and his talent, given what he's done for our team already this season, when there's we've offered little to nothing else. I think it would be very harsh, but at the same time, it did seem to work. I don't think it's a long term solution necessarily. I think there does have to be mm. a way which you get them both in the team, and whether that is maybe not with Ramirez starting as the ten, but someone perhaps a little bit more creative with Miofsky through the middle, and then perhaps Duke off the left. That could be a, a potential option. I don't know. But we need to start getting the best out of both of them. I mean, we found how to get the best out of Miofsky. We found mm. sort of how to get the best out of Duke. But as individuals, perhaps, rather as a partnership. 
which is yeah, I, I'm not, I think that's fair. And right now, I think because of the way results are going, we're almost just trying to throw everything at it and hope something works and breaks this kind of bad run of form. But unfortunately, the big games keep go- keep coming and the pressure keeps mounting. It does. Uh, and, you know, results at home against bottom of the league doesn't help. Um, at the same time, it probably goes back to, oh my God, <clears throat> I'm also ill, this is not good. <laughs> uh, it goes, probably goes back to signing players to fit a system rather than signing these players mm-hmm. and then try to fit them in in, in the end, I don't know whether perhaps Duke's emergence of what he is is maybe taking Goodwin by surprise. I suppose yeah. it's maybe something else. Don't know if he perhaps perhaps didn't expect this development so quickly, but it's a good problem to have to degree, even if we are not managing it effectively at the moment. Yeah, and against bottom of the league at home, nil nil. What do you make of Jim Goodwin's decision to take off first leg, Christian Ramirez, and then? Well, I don't know, it was it 10, 10 or so minutes later, he also takes off Boya Mioski, a player who, at the time, I thought, you know, he hadn't been offering much, so I understood why he was taking him off. But my criticism on the substitution is, once you take Ramirez off, as soon as he then takes Mioski off, we've lost all height in that team, especially yep. when your replacements are Johnny Hayes and Vinny Vizdawin. It was bizarre. I think that's also a problem we have from starting all three because if you hadn't started sort of Ramirez for example you then with 20 minutes to go still looking for a goal you have the option of bringing him on when mm. instead <clears throat> it's sort of 70 minutes or whatever it was it's not worked and we've got to take them off to then try something and then you're lacking players and bodies in the box in particular to try and take those chances and mm-hmm. you certainly mentioned I mean we took off the two strikers that were over six foot leaving yeah. Duke on, Johnny Hayes and Basawin then coming on. And then, and we're still hoying balls into the box at defenders who simply love heading the ball away. It's their meat and drink. Yeah. Do that all day long for them. That's exactly what they want. If you run at them and, <clears throat> and try and be a little bit more intricate with things, speed the ball up a little bit more, that's when they would start to struggle. Maybe try and get them in behind. Difficult when they won't come out at all, mind you. But... Yeah, I, I think the problem was we just we with the substitutions we ended up just playing straight into Ross County's hands because at that point in the game they were more than content with a point and we were probably just going right we'll just sit and take what we've got and if we've got the opportunity to hit on the counter let's do that and unfortunately we had no target I mean the service wasn't there in the first seventy minutes anyway it wasn't likely to improve and you've put it down there was a draw fair result because. Arguably, and I think you're correct here, we didn't do enough to win that game, which for me against bottom of the league at home is massively concerning. Absolutely. I think you don't score at home. You probably yeah, you don't deserve to win the game. And I think the draw absolutely fair result. I know we had chances, Kennedy off the line, um, McCrory's chance later on, as well as the others you mentioned. Still don't think it's enough. Um, it's not like we've forced laid law into many a save. I mean, if you think about it, the chances that we've mentioned on uh, so far on the show, McCrory putting it wide, or uh, Kennedy was cleared off the line. Laid law didn't have that much to do, uh, despite mm-hmm. the seven shots on target. Didn't test him nearly enough. We weren't quick enough on the ball. I think draw absolutely fair result. And to be in this position now, where hearts are starting to look very good and we're coming away from a game against Ross County, bottom of the league, having yeah. looked hopeless, and we're saying that draw is a fair result. It's not really good enough, is it? No, no, it's not. And on the back of that, what do you make of then Jim Goodwin's comments when he comes out and said, well, ultimately, you know, about kind of stopping the rot after, you know, four defeats in a row. It was just about not losing another game, I guess. I mean, admittedly, I am glad we've not lost the game. However, that was not, surely not the intention going into it, you wouldn't have thought. Um, I, you would have thought probably a perfect chance to start the new year if you're going to handpick a fixture, it is bottom of the league at home. And we're still despite, completely without scoring. Yeah, despite the fact that that's now Ross County unbeaten in six games against us. Well, yeah, of course. But they have been a bit of a bogey team. But regardless, we should still have more than enough about us to to to, to best them. Um, and we've come away and Jim Goodwin's coming out with that. Yeah, I'm glad we've not lost. But I mean, what what what, what the fuck does that mean? How's that going to help us towards our goals this, towards this season? Yeah. And Jim Goodwin wasn't concerned 
by the reaction of the fans come full time. I don't know if um, you vented your frustration at the the full time whistle. I know I certainly did. Um, are you concerned that Jim Goodwin's not concerned about the fans' reaction? I'm not concerned nor surprised, given his comments about fans and how they felt about things prior. Mm. Um, I suppose he's got to come out and say, "Oh, you know, it's no, we're trying to stick to our plan, and you know, they can say how they feel, whatever." Mm-hmm. However, I wasn't surprised by the fans' reaction. Uh, I, I did boo a little bit. Uh, I actually <laughs> stayed to boo a little bit, to be honest. We'd have happily left about 10, <laughs> 15 minutes earlier. Mm. Um, I just think, I don't know. I don't I don't know where this, get, where this gets better, uh, other than starting to put three points on the board, because performance like that, absolutely shocking. And I don't know. I feel like he has to come out and say, Oh, we'll just try and stick and do our jobs and stay focused and things like that. And you can't like, listen to sort of the outside frustrations because I think as soon as he starts addressing that, I think it's only going to go one way. Yeah. Um, so, is there anything in your mind then that Goodwin could do to resurrect the pressure? I know obviously we've got St. Johnson coming up this weekend, and three points would go some way to appeasing some of the upset in the in the stands, certainly, but. Is he on a, a slippery slope already that's nearly irreversible? It certainly seems that way. However, I, let's not forget, Aberdeen Arn is an uh, emotional city. And, you know, mm-hmm. Get three points against St. Johnston and win the semi-final. Everyone all forgot about any of it. Nobody cares. Uh, mm. that, that's basically what he's got to do, as well as start getting bodies in the door. However, mm-hmm. I don't understand it's very difficult. Uh, and we are on awful form. I think those things would start maybe giving people hope uh, right now because I feel like with every result at the moment, we're just everyone's getting more and more negative. The fact that that, that idea of finishing third, qualifying for a group stage football, regardless, mm. is sort of slipping away. And I'm kind of accepting that at this stage already. Yeah. And then um, that and that's and hearts getting better uh, isn't helping that, especially since they look. <laughs> sort of act, active in the transfer window and right now we I don't know what's going on nothing yeah and I think you know that statement there is quite damning of where we are just now is the fact that we're not even halfway through January and we're already verging on the acceptance that third place is nearly gone Um, obviously mathematically not but I'm not seeing anything from us that suggests we'll stop the rot and I'm not seeing anything from Hearts just now, especially the amount of penalties that they're getting, that will influence them or stop them from the this run of form that, that they're on. Mm. Um, but we need to address the problem, and that needs to start this Saturday. But before we get into the preview of Saturday's game, um, if those of you that do follow us on Twitter, which is at RTG underscore podcast, you'll have seen a tweet that we put out on Monday, we have a semi-final mix being created by original FM DJ Just Beth on Twitter. Her handle is at Just Beth Fifteen. Um, so if you find the tweet uh, and put in your song suggestions, she's going to create a mix for the end of the Rangers preview that we'll get out at the end of next week just to give you some maybe uplifting songs to get you into the mood because god knows if saturday doesn't go well you'll need something to lift the mood oh i mean absolutely because right now really not looking forward to it and i'm just glad i won't be stuck on a bus with you uh, at this point. <laughs> thanks <laughs> no thanks but we need to get things corrected first and foremost and that starts with st johnston St. Johnson coming to Pataudry on the back of a narrow 1-0 defeat to Dundee United last time out at um, McDermott Park, but sit just two points behind us in seventh place. So an opportunity for them, certainly an incentive. And despite three losses on the bounce, Callum, they have a decent record away from home. Four wins away at Motherwell, Hibs, County, and they've even got a draw in there as well. Does their away form and probably the fact that they'll maybe mirror Ross County in terms of setup and an approach to the game. Does that worry you given how Monday went? It does concern me because, uh, well, yeah, they've been pretty good on the road, certainly better than we have. Uh, however, that's not saying much. And I think they will likely mirror uh, Ross County. However, they actually have, well, they've got far more quality to hurt us uh, going forward, uh, essentially. Mm-hmm. 
are probably defensively too. They're probably a bit more um, robust, uh, you, you'd think as well. But in terms of hitting us on the counter-attack, I mean, certainly St. John's will come here, soak up pressure and try and do that. And they've got players that, that are capable of... Uh, capable of punishing us and you know certainly no more than Stevie May which we're more than uh, too familiar with yeah exactly I'll put my money on seeing Stevie May do a gritty in front of the red shed when he bangs one home I'm sure but even from dead balls they've got Graham Carey as well and they've got a target man from set pieces of course because emotional for you I'm sure and emotional for others Andy Constein makes his return to Pataudry this weekend and we said it last season when the likes of Calum Hendry came back and, and scored. Is it going to be written in the stars for him to bang one in or him to be involved or even Adam Montgomery, of course, making up to three ex-dons returning? I mean, I suppose Nicky Clark as well. Oh, God, there's so yeah. many. Um, yeah, I'm concerned about Andy Codd today a little bit. I, it'll be so sad to see him playing for another team at Pataudry. I'm not looking forward to that at all. And if he scores... It'll be upsetting. It, God what do you think he scores. does? What? Huh? What do you think he does if he scores? Two foots, Jim Grew in and in stand, probably. <laughs> uh, I don't think people would complain about that, really, at, at, no. at this rate. I mean, I don't know. I, in a, probably in a sick way, I'd be happy for him, given the way he was treated uh, by, you could argue, his agent didn't help him at all. But I still just love Andy Cornstein, and no, no matter what anyone else says, we'll change that. Um, and it's just going to be a, very upsetting. I need to prepare myself mentally I think for this especially if he does go on to score goodness me it could be bad yeah I guess then obviously we made three changes for the the game against Ross County on Monday night do you expect similar to be made because obviously the the system didn't work against Ross County Ramirez to drop back out for you maybe a return for Connor Barron I hope not uh, <laughs> is that on both Um. Probably. No, uh, I, I don't want Barrett to play, to be honest. Uh, he's just annoying me at the minute. Sorry, Connor, if you're tuning in. Probably not. You've got better things to do than listen to us speak pish. Um, I don't know. I At this point, I don't know what he's going to surprise us with uh, to go from the start. However, I would like to see the return of two normal wingers and full backs will get up in support and provide service in the box. And I'd like to see Basalwin start. I know he's not done enough at all since or so far this season since the cup group stages however I just want normal wingers and I don't know why I want Johnny Hayes to be one of them to be honest because god he was terrible when he came up <laughs> well again putting question marks around how fully fit he actually is but I was going to say I would rather have Johnny Hayes start because again we've probably seen more from him this season compared to Vinny uh, although that's maybe through no fault of Vinny's own given his lack of game time so I guess we know what Johnny Hayes can can do, but we certainly need a directness and we need an end product because our final third has been just god awful. And in we, weeks. we need to be able to hit, hit them quickly because they'll get if we allow them to have time like we did against Ross County to get set up defensively. That is their game. They are happy to just let us have the ball and potentially hit us on the counter attack. Whereas when we win the ball after they've come out, we need to be able to get back at them quick before they get set up into their defensive position. Otherwise, it's going to be the same old, same old, and uh, maybe Brian is still making an appearance and bang one into the top corner again. <laughs> oh, what a grim day that was. Um, obviously, we want to see some good movement on the pitch from Aberdeen, but we also want to see movement off the pitch um, in terms of the January transfer window, which has now been open for four days at time of recording. Is it a worry that for you just now with the way our defence is going and um, that we've not seen any movement yet, especially when you see clubs like Celtic and Kilmarnock already moving to strengthen or recall players to improve mm. their sides. It is a concern. I mean, I know certainly Celtic in particular have... A hell of fish. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I have, I have, I have a, you know, infinite amount of resources almost, it seems like, compared to everyone else and they would mm. be able to make these moves quickly. But they'd signed or agreed to sign three players before the new year even started. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, us, we know what our issues have been. There's still nothing as of yet after five honking performances in a row. Still nothing at time of recording. It's a bit of a worry. I'd like to have seen us 
bolster their players in. They also had five weeks off where they were doing seemingly nothing on the training ground as well. So <laughs> it's, it's it's a worry. And I know it's January. Yeah. I know it's difficult when you're sort of our size and there's, if there's money involved, it makes it m- more hard. However, I would like to see some movement and fast because otherwise it could get even more ugly. And I think that's highly likely. And yeah. Jim Quinn's um, always talked about, sorry, Jim Quinn's always talked about well, it's coming in there, you know, they work in advance, they've they identified players in plenty of, uh, plenty of time. They don't just, as soon as, you know, for example, the summer comes around, they go, oh, we can sign players now, let's look for some. They know yeah. players that are uh, they're looking at, I know availability changes and things like that, but it's a worry that nothing's happened yeah. as of yet. Yeah, and, you know, the, the cynic uh, in the Aberdeen fans will say that the delay is maybe casting doubt over Dave Cormack's thoughts on the future of Jim Goodwin. Can you see where people would be coming from on that? Or again, should we <clears throat> look at the other side of the glass and say, well, it is, as you said, a difficult market to work in. Obviously, the the links with the, the boy from Tranmere, who grabbed a couple of assists recently in, in their match against Doncaster. So maybe other suitors are becoming involved. It, it's going to be a difficult market for us to work in. But on top of that, do you also think the way we've been performing recently is potentially hindering us because <clears throat> failure to win on Saturday against St. Johnson, going out of the cup and losing to Hearts three days later, suddenly puts us in a very unattractive position with half the window to go. Absolutely. And especially if it goes tits up against Darville as well, which I'm growing increasingly worried about. <laughs> yeah. um, I think perhaps results would have definitely um made us less attractive maybe uh, uh, you know prior to going into uh, to coming back from the world cup we're sitting third you've got a semi final two good selling <laughs> points now however fourth and slipping and likely to get hammered in the semi final less attractive proposition and mm. i would be lying if i hadn't thought about you know dave cormack perhaps doing the same as last year uh, in terms of not perhaps backing the manager quite the way they would have liked because he's kind of humming and haying, but at the same time, Goodwin has come in and said it will take two or three transfer windows to get them where they want to be um, from the start. So, mm-hmm. and I, I don't think he's going to be going anywhere soon. Uh, yeah. so at, certainly, at this moment in time. So, I don't know if that that will be playing into things, but all of it just worrying around in my head whilst I wait patiently for a Twitter for notification just isn't helping at all. Yeah. Uh, and one Twitter notification that did spark rumour, and he seems to be becoming the new Greg Wilde um, during transfer windows now, is Graham Shinney apparently um, transfer listed by Wigan Athletic. Would you have him back? In a bloody heartbeat. I mean, I don't know if it makes sense for what we're looking for this window, but a leader like him and a potential industrious as fuck midfield <laughs> of Ramadani, him and McCrory, just no creativity, just absolutely nailing people, just... Gets me going. I'll have him back in a heartbeat. He's probably going to go back to Derby. Got excited for no reason, but a boy can dream. Yeah, and and I think you've got to dream. And it's one of those players that I suppose is a bit versatile. And as you said, leadership quality knows what the club means to to him and and the fans as well. But I suppose there's that age-old debate about taking players that used to play for the club back, isn't there? There is. It always seems to be a bit of a controversial one, regardless of how good they are. Um, but I think I would have it back. Would Would you? Would you? What would you think? I'm kind of I'm kind of on the fence on it. What? Um, I I absolutely can see where you're coming from, but part of me also feels like he's getting on that aging side, and it would just be kind of a more of a like a fanfare just to get the the fans buzzing and then uh, a couple of defeats later you're back to back to square one but the question was kind of posed to us this is why this topic has been put into the episode it was posed to us by at Fraser Waters 03 any ex dons still playing you take back um he obviously put realistic Graham Shinney not sure where you'd fit in but Kenny McLean um, I'm not sure how much game time he's actually getting at Norwich just now. Um, and although, as I said, we've got quite a lot of midfielders, is there any other former Dons players out there that you would 
have back at Bataudry just now. Let's try and end on something a bit more creative and raise the spirit. Okay, I'll go realistic to start with and then obvious <laughs> unrealistic, but we'll try and make ourselves a little bit happy and think about the good times at the end of the episode. So realistically, I don't know how real- realistic it is given his situation at his current club. However, we'll be friend of the show, Mr. Jack Grimmer. Mm-hmm. We are struggling at right back. He knows, gets along with Anthony Stewart very well. Perhaps they could, you know, improve each other. A little bit of familiar familiarity. He's a local lad. You know I love one. You know I love one. <laughs> uh, and I, I, I don't know. I just I think he would realistically perhaps be a good acquisition in terms of improving us because he's actually where we need uh, improvement as well. Um, unrealistic, there's a good few. I think Ken McLean probably comes under that, but I'd obviously have him back in a heartbeat. Scott McKenna solves many a problem, and he's huge. So I'd have him. And one you won't be expecting me to mention right now, however, given his situation at his former club, he will be available, however, not to us. No, his current club, he'll be available, but not to us. And it's Ryan Portis, because he was in the Aberdeen youth <laughs> setup once upon a time. And I would have him just to make Michael annoyed, really. And he probably <laughs> would improve things as well. So there we go. I, I'm sure people have fun uh, with that one. <laughs> yeah, well, I suppose at right back, Jack Grimmer is a, is a very good suggestion. Obviously, Michael Hector has been another one um, that has been mentioned as well. And I th- Again, a player that knows the club is a bit versatile. Unrealistic, Ryan Fraser, out of favour at Newcastle. Maybe, again, local lad, know how much you love them. Get them back, playing for the club. And then if we're looking for a striker, um, if Christian Ramirez wants to depart, what about former Don Joe Nuttall, who has scored 11 in 22 games in the National League so far this season? Well, we do love National League players, don't we? Uh, where's he playing right now? Is it Tranmere? He's at Oldham Athletic. Oldham Athletic. All oh, right. Okay. Well, you can maybe pick up Josh Dacros Cogley on the way there, Northwest England. Um, I really thought you were going to mention Sam Cosgrove there. Well, yeah. Um, yeah. Again, banging in the goals, I suppose. Um, but we've made our money from him, so I would like to. We'll just do it again. Money. It'll just be like money laundering. We'll just keep signing him. He scores loads of penalties and then ship him off again. Yeah, well, we've I think we've maybe already covered money uh, laundering before. Um, mm. Ronald? I'll have Ronald? him back, actually. Get <laughs> him back. Give him a chance he deserves. Exactly. I mean, you know, like, like athletic forward-thinking full-backs, give him a go. Why not? Exactly. As Callum said, let us know in the comments below if you're watching on YouTube who you would have back as a former Don or tweet us at RTG underscore podcast as well. That has us covered the dross from Ross County and tried to raise the spirits ahead of the Saints visit north. God help us if we don't get three points because we need something to cheer us up and make us all feel better. But thank you very much once again to the sport show and especially on the back of the last episode, a real fantastic response on both audio and um, video. I'm wishing you all a happy new year and some success to the Dons in the very near future. We need it, man. Very badly.